That night, I never imagined that a pizza delivery could turn into a nightmare that would change my life forever. Having worked as a delivery driver for years, I was accustomed to some tricky routes and odd customers, but nothing compared to what I would face on that lonely, cold night. It was around 10 o'clock when I received the order. Four large pizzas to a house in the rural area, well beyond the usual routes. The address was unfamiliar, and the GPS indicated a long journey on dirt roads. The prospect of a good tip motivated me, despite the discomfort of traveling so far at night. I drove for almost an hour, sinking deeper into the darkness of the countryside. The dirt roads were narrow and poorly lit, and my car rocked with every hole and stone on the way. Finally, I arrived at the address. A strange feeling took over me as I spotted the house. An old, weather-beaten building, completely isolated, with no other buildings nearby. The lights were on, but there were no cars in front, nor sounds of people or music that would indicate a party. I took the pizzas and walked to the door. I rang the doorbell several times, but there was no answer. I tried knocking on the door, but only the empty echo of the house responded. As I waited, I heard noises coming from inside, heavy footsteps, something being dragged. My heart raced. Maybe it's better to leave, I thought. But the concern about my boss's reaction if I returned with the pizzas made me hesitate. It was then that I noticed movement in the window next to the door. Someone was watching me. A dark figure peered through the old curtains. I couldn't see their face, but enough to send a chill down my spine. I decided it was time to leave, but as I turned to set the pizzas on the ground, my foot tripped and the boxes fell, scattering across the porch floor. I ran back to the car, my heart beating in desperation. As I got in and tried to start it, nothing happened. You've got to be kidding me, I muttered, trying several times until the engine finally started. But when I tried to drive away, I realized something was wrong. The car barely moved. I got out to check and discovered, horrified, that all the tires had been slashed. In a panic, I locked the doors and called the police. The operator advised me to stay in the car and not to leave until help arrived. Each second seemed like an eternity. I stayed there, trembling, listening to every sound of the night. Then, I saw the figure again this time clearly a woman, with long, unkempt hair, looking at me through the car window. I screamed, startled, and she disappeared as suddenly as she appeared. In a panic, I locked the doors quickly and grabbed my cell phone to call the police. The operator's voice on the other end of the line seemed distant, almost unreal, as I explained my location and situation. He advised me to stay in the car and not to leave, saying that help was on the way. I hung up the phone and tried to calm myself, but the fear was palpable, suffocating. Each second seemed to drag on, turning into an eternity of waiting. Huddled in the driver's seat, I trembled uncontrollably, my eyes wide, scanning the darkness around me. The sounds of the night were amplified by my fear. Then, I saw the figure again, this time clearly a woman. She was outside, peeping through the passenger window. Her long, unkempt hair fell over her face wildly, her wide eyes fixed on mine. She didn't blink, didn't move, just watched me with an intensity that chilled my blood. Her presence was so unexpected and frightening that I let out an involuntary scream, the voice echoing within the confinement of the car. As soon as I screamed, she disappeared. One moment she was there, and the next, she had vanished into the darkness as if she were just a shadow or an illusion. I wondered if my mind was playing tricks on me, if fear had led me to see things that weren't there. But the terror in my heart was real enough, the sense of imminent danger too palpable. I stayed there, staring intently at the void where she had been, wondering if she would return whether she was real or just a specter of my imagination. 
The wait for the police dragged on, each minute increasing my torment. The police arrived after a time that seemed interminable. They rescued me and investigated the house, finding only sharp objects and no signs of the occupants. I was informed later that the house had been abandoned for years. That night left deep marks on me. I couldn't work as a delivery driver anymore, always haunted by the face I saw in the window and the sounds of that house. The pizzas were just a pretext for something much more sinister, or perhaps just a mistake on an especially dark night. But either way, I was never the same after that delivery. I remember that night as if it were yesterday. The house was quiet, except for the distant murmur of the television in the living room. I was lying on my bed, a notebook sprawled beside me, trying to focus on the math homework that seemed more complicated that night. My room, always a refuge, felt strangely oppressive, with the darkness outside pressing against the thin curtains. That's when I first heard it. A soft laugh, almost like a whisper, but distinctly that of a child. I stopped writing, lifting my head, trying to discern if it was just my imagination. The house remained silent, and I returned to my work, dismissing the sound as an echo of my tired thoughts. But then it happened again, louder this time, unmistakably real, emanating from somewhere near the floor. I looked around, my heart starting to beat faster. The laugh came once more, a clear and crystalline sequence of notes that seemed to dance in the stagnant air of the room. There was no more denying or ignoring it. Something was very wrong. With a mix of fear and curiosity, I got off the bed and crawled towards the ventilation opening on the floor. The sound seemed to emanate from there, somehow distorted by the labyrinth of ducks hidden beneath the surface of our house. My heart pounded against my chest as I approached, the dim light from my lamp barely reaching the floor in front of me. Getting closer, I hesitated, my stomach turning with fear. The laugh occurred again, this time so close that it made me recoil. But curiosity overcame fear, and slowly, I leaned my head to look into the darkness of the duct. Inside, two bright eyes stared back at me, small, intense, and terribly lucid. There was nothing childish about them, despite the sound that preceded them. They were eyes that knew too much, that saw beyond what they should. The cold air from the ventilation brushed my face as I froze, unable to move or look away. Then, in an instant, the eyes disappeared along with the laughter, as if they had never existed. I recoiled, stumbling back to my bed, my choked scream calling for my mother. She came running, concerned, but when I explained, there was nothing left to show her. There was no sound, no eyes, just the echo of my own fear. That night, I did not sleep. In the days that followed, every sound in the house made me shudder. I was forced to return to my room to face the place where my tranquility was broken. I spent four more years in that house, and the laughter never returned. But those eyes, they followed me. In every shadow, in every whisper of the wind, I felt the weight of something I had seen and should never have seen. The experience left a mark, a constant reminder that sometimes what we hear and see can be more real and terrifying than we could ever imagine. Routine has always been an anchor for me, something that allowed me to navigate the daily chaos with a certain peace of mind. Living in a quiet neighborhood in Madison, Wisconsin, only reinforced this sense of security. Every day, I followed the same path to work, a 15-minute walk to the bus station, passing through tree-lined streets and cozy cafes. But it was this predictability that put me in danger. One Wednesday morning, with the cool autumn air gently blowing, I noticed for the first time a black, old model car parked oddly on one of the less busy streets of my route. A hooded man was outside, 
leaning over the open hood. He seemed to be struggling with something in the engine. As I approached, he looked up and our eyes met. There was a plea in his gaze, almost as if he expected me to stop and offer help. But something inside me screamed to keep walking. Perhaps it was the way the car was hidden under the trees, or how the man seemed to be conveniently in trouble just as a lone woman passed by. I listened to my intuition and quickened my pace, taking a more lit and busy street, even though it meant arriving late to work. In the days following that strange encounter, I tried to divert my thoughts from that unsettling morning. I tried to convince myself it was just paranoia, perhaps a result of watching too many suspense movies recently or the social isolation brought on by the pandemic. Every shadow seemed suspect. Every strange look on the streets took on undue importance. You're being irrational. I repeated to myself as I walked through the same tree-lined streets, now with a more cautious gaze. However, the apparent normality was abruptly broken on Friday morning. As I passed the neighborhood supermarket, which I regularly frequented, my heart stopped for a moment. There it was, the same black old model car, parked carelessly near the main entrance of the establishment. There was no one inside or around it, but the mere sight of the vehicle sent a chill down my spine. All the fear I had tried to suppress returned with increased intensity. Instinctively, I moved a bit away, seeking the safety provided by distance while watching the car closely. Nothing seemed different, no movement around, but I could not ignore the alarms sounding in my mind, warnings of danger that I could no longer dismiss as mere products of my imagination. Quickly, I pulled my cell phone from my purse. My hands trembled slightly as I dialed the local police number, and my voice faltered as I reported the vehicle. There's a black, old model car parked irregularly near the supermarket, I explained, trying to stay calm. I, I saw it before, under strange circumstances, and something about it doesn't seem right. The dispatcher on the phone assured me that they would send a patrol to check the situation. I thanked them and hung up, remaining nearby, watching from a distance. As I waited, the reality of the situation began to settle in my chest. I was not just protecting myself. By making that call, I might be preventing others from falling into a dangerous trap. Moments like this made me question how many times we have to ignore our instincts to conform to the supposed normality of everyday life. The police response was surprisingly quick. They informed me that the car had been stolen and was involved in a series of minor crimes around the city. I thanked them, relieved to have trusted my intuition, and hung up, shaking. From that moment on, my routine was never the same again. I began to vary the times and paths I took every day. I invested in self-defense classes and became more observant of my surroundings. The reality that my routine could have made me a victim was a hard and transformative shock. Telling this story is not easy. The feeling of vulnerability still lingers, even knowing that I acted in the best possible way that day. The neighborhood no longer seemed as safe to me 